All right, we can begin. Okay. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on the time zone from where you're watching us. Uh, and so goes the life of global engagement. Uh, we, <clears throat> this is a, um, a webinar um, of Western Michigan University uh, for our global engagement. All right, we can begin. So today here we will have um, several uh, several representatives from Western Michigan, from our colleges and the Haneke Institute for Global Education, our international office. And we have many participants from all over the world, not only our students, uh, but also uh, newly admitted students and uh, some of our partner universities throughout the world are here today as well. And also our country representatives, our WMU, um, liaison officers throughout the world. I'd like to thank you all for participating in this webinar today. Um, we, the goal for this webinar is to uh, establish contact with our global network and with our students um, all over the world and to remind ourselves, to remind all of us that um, we are working towards a great um, academic year 2021. Uh, we have lived through very strange and difficult challenging times over the last uh, four or five months, six months, all of us uh, all over the world. And, um, and I think that um, sometimes um, that contributed to um, not having a such a, a, a frequent communication as we used to have, but that also made all of us feel closer in a certain way or a need for closeness um, between all of us. And so we've established a series of webinars, some only with our partner universities, others only with our students, some others will be only with our newly admitted students. We're connecting frequently with our uh, country liaisons as well. And um, we all feel after those uh, webinars that um, we missed this contact and we missed this closeness probably even more than during a regular semester, than a semester, a pre-pandemic semester, <laughs> we'd call it. And so we want to reassure our students and our partner universities and our, our global engagement network that we are here for you, we are together still, and we are still thinking of you. And we're still doing great things. And that is why we invited um, also to be here today, um, three of our deans representing three uh, WME colleges. And that's how we're going to start our presentation today. And we have with us today, and I'm really thankful and grateful for the presence here in this webinar, we have Dr. Satish Despande, is the Dean of the Hayward College of Business. We also have Dr. Steve Butt, is the Dean of our College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And Dr. Karla Koretsky, and she's the Dean of our College of Arts and Sciences. And obviously between these three colleges, we have um, a large, um, a large amount of global engagement activities of international students, of uh, uh, faculty who work internationally. These are three of our um, magnet colleges for global engagement, I must say. And I'm truly grateful for having our three deans um, here today. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Dr. Satish Despande to um, give a few remarks and then we'll go on with the rest of the panel and I'll introduce later the other participants. So Dr. Despande, please, the mic is yours. <laughs> and you have to unmute yourself. And now the mic is truly yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. and. Uh... Greetings from the Hayworth College of Business. I'm Satish Deshpande, Dean of the Hayworth College of Business. And what I want to do is start off with a short video, which gives you an idea as to, uh, you know, what the Hayworth College of Business is like. 
So could you please play the video? Taking your first steps at the Hayworth College of Business isn't about knowing exactly where you're going. It's about exploration, searching for the passion that drives you to change the world. The Hayworth College of Business is about limitless experiences. From our nationally recognized programs, ranging from integrated supply management to food and consumer packaged goods marketing to sales and business marketing, the possibilities are endless. It's about the resources to help you go from being a student to a leader. Resources like the Career Center, offering customized support for first and second year students exploring majors or juniors and seniors searching for that perfect internship or job. We were about fostering lasting relationships, professors with leading industry experience ready to equip you with tools for success, advisors with a passion for directing you to your desired destination, and lifelong friendships that go far beyond the classroom. At the Hayworth College of Business, it's not about the destination. It's about the experiences and relationships you make during your journey. Thank you. And that was just a flavor of what we look like and what the classrooms look like and uh, just highlighted some of our facilities. So uh, the Hayworth College of Business uh, is among the uh, elite 5% of the AACSB accredited business colleges in the world. Uh, so it's, uh, that's the seal of approval we have. We have about uh, 3,500 undergraduate students, about 400 uh, Graduate students, uh, many of our undergraduate programs are nationally ranked. A number of them are in the top three in the United States. So at the undergrad level, we have 17 majors and uh, 15 minors. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, when it comes to graduate programs, we basically have three programs. Uh, we have a new MS in cybersecurity, which is a collaboration with our friends in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. It's online. It's uh, between our computer, si computer science department in engineering and our information systems in uh, the business school. We have a master's of business administration and MBA. We also have an MS in accountancy, uh, and that's very helpful for folks uh, who want to uh, sit for the uh, CPA exam. So that's, that's basically where we focus our graduate programs on. Next slide, please. So here is uh, a list of different undergraduate programs. Uh, I just want to talk about a few. Uh, for example, let's talk about some of the new programs you have, uh, digital marketing and e-conference. That's uh, a program which we put in a couple of years back. It's a collaboration between our marketing department and information systems. Uh, it's, it's a joint program. And uh, what I'm proud to say is uh, in the most recent uh, Northwest Digital Marketing Competition, our team won the first prize. So we are national champions and we also got the best research paper. Uh, if you look at some of the other programs, food and consumer packaging goods, again, that's ranked in the top three in the United States. Uh, what I really push to do is have our students go out and participate in uh, various national competitions. And our true worth is how we do well in those national competitions against all the other universities uh, in the United States. And for many of these competitions, we also have uh, uh, students coming from across the world. Sales and business marketing, again, uh, one of our uh, uh, top programs, uh, top program in the country. Our ISM program is ranked in the top 10 by Gartner. So as you can see, we have a number of programs which uh, are highly rated. And again, uh, we kind of reach across campus and work with our colleagues in other colleges to make sure that uh, we get the best talent from the university. Next slide, please. So uh, I just want to show you some rooms. So this is our Kaiser Sales and Negotiation and Leadership Lab. This is where all the sales classes are held. Again, that's one of the top programs in the country. We do not teach sales in a classroom. You don't have a professor standing in front of a room and telling you, this is how you sell. 
So this basically is an office suite with six rooms. It has a boardroom, conference room, meeting rooms with cameras all over the place. So when you take your sales classes, you're actually learning how to sell. And we are learning how to sell real products. So for example, Striker, a local company might come in and give us some of their products and we would train our people to sell those products. So one semester you could be selling hospital beds, next semester you would learn how to sell uh, healthcare equipment, uh, it could be uh, snowmobiles, so a variety of products. So when you go for a job, you can actually show your employers a video of how you have progressed in actual selling over the, fee over the, over the last four years. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our Greenleaf Trust Trading Room. Uh, all our finance classes are here. We are one of the 42 schools across the world whose finance program is Bloomberg certified. You learn finance on the same platform. You use the same software that uh, business analysts and traders use on Wall Street. The students also, in one of their classes, um, manage a $1.5 million actual stock portfolio. And so when you walk through the trading room, you can actually see what the students are buying and selling and what portfolio they have. Again, state-of-the-art, world-class, that's what the market wants, and we use the same stuff that uh, uh, folks in the industry use. Next slide, please. Uh, we have our own career center. So, um, our career center is the Zhang Career Center. It's uh, named after uh, Lin and Chan Zhang, who basically funded this center. So we have our own career advisors. Uh, uh, we have our own recruiters. Uh, so uh, one of the things you are required to do as a business student when you come in as a freshman, it's a requirement, is you have to go there. You have to learn how to go through mock interviews. As a freshman, you come in and prepare your resume. You do not wait till the senior year to come up with a resume. And so uh, when you're looking for employers, when you're looking at mock interviews, when you're looking at actual interviews, everything is done through our career center, which is in our building. Next slide, please. So you know, our post-graduation success rate is within three months of graduation, 94% of our students are fully employed or go to grad school or go to the military. Um, and then, of course, this, this percentage certainly goes up um, as you go to six months. Next slide, please. So again, uh, you know, these are some of the folks who recently got jobs. I kind of uh, flavor up different. Uh, someone got a job in ENJ Gallo, which is a winery. Someone got a job in a banking organization. Third one, this person got a job at Volkswagen, which is uh, an auto manufacturer. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a lot of networking uh, opportunities for employers. Every incoming student is guaranteed an extension. So uh, when you come in as a freshman, um, we guarantee that you will have an extension with the business. I mean, that's something we guarantee as a part of our career center. Uh, right now, since everything is online, many of these externships are uh, virtual extension, so you're connecting with someone in Silicon Valley via internet and other things. Um, we still have a few employers who are doing uh, actual internships, so they're actually bringing in inter interns at the workplace. Next slide, please. Yeah. So again, a couple of examples of internship. Here's a student who got an internship at Deloitte. Uh, so Deloitte is an accounting, big four accounting firm. Here's another one. Uh, at Parker Aerospace, uh, this is a company that makes hydraulics uh, for uh, jet engines, uh, for uh, jet planes. Um, here's someone who got an internship at Honda, which is uh, a worldwide auto manufacturer. Uh, so that's that's a brief outline of the Hayward College of Business. If you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to email me or get in touch with any of our folks at Higgy. And now I'll pass it on to Dr. Steve Matz, who's the Dean of uh, Western Michigan University's College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Well, greetings from the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I'm very excited to be here and be glad to answer any questions when we complete uh, the webinar. If I could do have, uh, before, yeah, if I could also have you run the video, that would be fantastic. Thank you.
Welcome to the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Western Michigan University. Our 3,000 students are part of a large public research university, but enjoy the benefits of a small college setting. We have our own beautiful campus just down the road from Western's main campus. The college offers 14 accredited undergraduate programs and 18 master's and doctoral programs. We have internationally recognized professors. They offer many research opportunities for both graduate and undergraduate students. In a rigorous program like engineering, sometimes it's hard to make a smooth transition from high school to college. The student success centers, <coughs> learning communities, and free tutoring and mentoring really make a difference. And there are so many ways to get involved. With 30 student organizations in the college alone, there's something for everyone. We participate in outreach activities, connect and network, attend conferences, and compete in design-build competitions around the country. Come visit us and see what sets us apart. Great, thank you. So what I'd like to continue on, hopefully you saw a lot of uh, pictures of student engagement, student, students actually being employed with uh, everything from a concrete canoe to a Baja vehicle and, and other things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in subsequent slides. But just to give you an idea of our campus, um, Ford Hall is set apart for the main campus a little ways. And we'll talk to, on the next slide just about how far that is. But in this picture, if you could see the bus that's actually sitting in the front of the building, there's actually a shuttle service between the two campuses, which gets our students out uh, to our campus every 30 minutes. So very easy transportation between the two campuses. We have a, a two-wing building, which uh, houses um, all of our departments, so all of engineering is in one space. And then finally, if you think just about our population right now, um, as of this, of this last year, we had just a little over 2,800 uh, total students with almost 2,400 of those being undergrad. Um, and in addition to that, in our building, we have 75 teaching and research labs. So they are doubling in some cases with research as well as teaching. So if you go to the next slide, please. So our, our, our building sits within something called the Business Technology and Research Park. And that park was designed from the beginning to really uh, support life sciences, advanced engineering and information technology in the community. And at, at the current time, there are 40 different companies in, uh, surrounding our campus and our, our building. And we're getting ready to build phase two of this park, which would then house a, additional companies. A, a lot of these companies are, uh, since they are related to our business as well, is uh, do internships, co-ops, et cetera, during the year. So not only do we have things that occur in the summer, but a lot of our students are working uh, during the year as well. So we're about uh, three and a half miles from the main campus, but it's uh, depending on the, the time of day, most of the time that's, that's about a 15 minute or less drive. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the programs that we do have. Uh, in the video, I think it said 14, and the reason that it is now 15 is we've added a cybersecurity degree at the undergrad level. And similar to, to what Dr. Uh, Despondi was talking about at the graduate level, this too is a fully online program. And it's being done in cooperation with the school business. And so again, we can um, have every, every single course could actually be taken online and not actually be on our campus. But we also have the opportunity to do that same degree on campus. So if you look at the gamut of degrees we have, so we've got the engineering, which in most cases are very traditional uh, names as you walk down through that list. We do have a couple of interesting ones, one being in paper engineering. There are only three programs left in the, in the U.S. in that specific area of engineering. And the other one is industrial and entrepreneurial engineering. And the piece of this is the traditional industrial engineering degree with an entrepreneurial bent. Uh, and essentially what we're looking at there is product and service design. So we will see everything from healthcare 
to um, manufacturing to other things as well within that degree and looking at how to design for that particular uh, area. Um, we also have three technology degrees, uh, one which is more focused on the CAD CAM areas, which is the engineering graphics and design technology. One, is, as the name implies, is in manufacturing and manufacturing processes. And then finally, the engineering management technology degree, which is uh, more of a, uh, a mixture of some business elements as well as uh, engineering elements. And then the applied sciences side of our house is, again, in addition to the cybersecurity, is our computer science degree. And we also have the ability to um, create essentially uh, everything from a print design to more of an electronic graphic design uh, program too. So that, that as well is very well received. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And, and the reason for bringing up most of the graduate programs, if, if you look at the, the left-hand column with the master's degree with all the asterisks, except for cyber at the moment, um, and manufacturing engineering, sorry. Uh, we actually have accelerated degrees, uh, which map from our undergraduate programs into our graduate program. So with one more year of work, um, so five years on a four-year bachelor's degree program, you could actually also acquire a master's degree uh, in that shorter time. And the way we do that is if you declare that in, say, your junior year, you, you would then start, or junior or third year, you would then start with uh, taking graduate courses as early as, as maybe your second semester of your third year and then all the way through your senior year as well. So those would then be double counting as electives for your undergraduate program and then uh, graduate courses for your graduate program. We also have seven PhD programs that again align with most of our uh, other departments um, in terms of where they're being offered. but. Um, so there is options to continue your education after and beyond either the bachelor's or the master's. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I don't want to necessarily read all through these, but I just wanted to give you an indication of some of the things that are available in our facility uh, and some of the research and experiences that are going on right now. So we do have uh, several research centers and institutes. Um, a lot of these uh, are very specific um, in, in, as you would expect in, in terms of what we are doing in those spaces. One of the newest is the one at the top um, is uh, advanced vehicle design and simulation. And what, what's going on in those spaces right now is everything from the autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, uh, et cetera. Um, we've also got uh, things going on with respect to aerospace. Uh, we do have an aerospace program, as you saw, at both the undergrad and master's level. Um, and then a lot of the other pieces are just more in line with a lot of the traditional engineering disciplines that you would face. Um, if we move on to the next slide, you're going to see even a bigger mess of uh, names. But, uh, but, but this is just a, a, a good glimpse of some of the, the labs. Again, when I started out, I, I said that we have 75 different teaching and research labs that are available to the student. And these are just some of those. And it, again, it's just mainly to give you an idea of some of those different disciplines and some of those different areas that you may be able to actually touch point with. Um, so in, in addition to this, the one thing I did leave out on, the, on, on a couple of slides prior uh, was again, talking about some of the different things that, that students can get involved with. So in addition to research and research labs, we also have a lot of registered student organizations, and, and along with those are things from the Baja vehicle, which you saw in the, in the clips, the Sunseeker. Uh, we've got Concrete Canoe, uh, Steel Bridge. Um, we've got a, a CubeSat, so a satellite uh, team. We have Rocketry and many others. All right? So there are many ways to get involved, not only in teaching and research, but also in, in competitions. Uh, and we do compete nationally and internationally in some cases. Um, some of those competitions over this last year were curtailed a bit, but we're still working on the new designs and the new design specs come out from the organizations which we're actually trying to meet those as we, we move through to the next year. We can go to the next slide, please. And again, just I, I don't want to spend time uh, individually on this, but just to give you some ideas. And I did. Uh, Hopefully there is available, there is a flyer available with all this information on it, as well as these slides I think will be available at a later time. 
but again, just to give you some more indications, there's lots of different things going on within our facility. Uh, and we have approximately 100 faculty in, that, in our space um, that are actually working on most of these pieces in, in different uh, aspects. All right, next slide. So we also have a very robust way for students to uh, meet and greet with our industry partners. And every year in September, um, this year is September 23rd, and this year it's actually going to be virtual, as, as you may expect. But um, we typically have over 200 different companies in our facility, uh, going from everything from a, an internship co-op uh, type of experience, all the way through those that are getting ready to go out into the workforce. So we do do very well uh, with these job fairs, and there are others as well, but this is typically our biggest one at the beginning of the year. And it's interesting, most of the industry will be hiring in September for the following year. So it's, it's that far out uh, right now in terms of when uh, they're trying to grab our engineers from our college uh, to actually be able to have a, a, a workforce ready to go in the following year. So uh, great experiences here, and this is also uh, in engineering. So if you can't get this link very quickly, you can always go to our sites and pull that up. Go to the next slide. All right, and this is my last slide. So I just wanted to, again, kind of uh, similar to Dr. Desponde, just give you some, some highlights of some of the things and the outcomes that, uh, that our students in this previous year, the 2018-2019, we're, we're currently surveying the 2019-2020 students. So, um, but if we just look at a few of these uh, in, in terms of highlights, I mean, I think one of the, the cool things that you'll see, particularly among our graduate students, is that 73% of the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences graduate student population is, uh, is our international students. So we're very open to having students uh, come in from all over the world and, and, and get experiences with us here in the U.S. 98% um, uh, had at least one instructor who made them excited about learning and, and, and so on as you kind of go down the list. If we hit a couple of the other ones down at the bottom, uh, 70% had a, a job or internship, so this is this plays into your CPT uh, uh, chances. And so there are lots of opportunities as an international student, as well as domestic, to be able to uh, work. And a lot of those, again, come through those um, different uh, uh, job fairs, similar to the one I showed you on the previous page. Um, many students get involved, and that's the 42% of our students get involved in some sort of student uh, organization and then compete in many cases. And a lot of travel in, in years past, there's been travel associated with that. A lot of that in this last year has been virtual, but there still have been experiences and competition. And then lastly, if we just, just kind of look at the employment, 96% of our students, similar to um, Dr. Desponde's number as well, uh, either uh, find a job or are working, in, are going towards more education uh, as they leave our graduate programs and undergraduate programs. And again, this includes the ability to do OPT. Okay, so beyond us, we can also help with that and support that. And I think you're going to hear about that more later in the presentation. And then finally, it's interesting, but uh, most of our students stay around. So about 53% of all of our students still have jobs in the state of Michigan. So there are still opportunities on both the west and east side of Michigan. If you get a map out, take a look. Detroit's on the east side, and, and we're on the west side. So. Um, so I'll be around for questions later and would, would love to communicate and talk with anyone. So the next slide. So I'm going to hand it over to, to Dr. Carla Koretsky. Hi, uh, I'm Carla Koretsky. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at Western Michigan University. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have a chance to share some information about our college with all of you today. Um, I will be here for the question and answer, um, but you're also more than welcome to email me, especially if you're viewing this later. Um, my email is carla.koretsky at wmich.edu. So feel free to send questions that way as well. Um, next slide, please. So the College of Arts and Sciences has a mission um, to sustain, to ignite and sustain a passion for learning and discovery in the humanities, social sciences and sciences. And we aim to help students, staff, and faculty succeed in life and contribute to the betterment of our communities, from our local communities to our global communities. 
We emphasize a lot of the skills um, throughout our curriculum across our programs, which we think are really important for our graduates to be successful. And so that includes things like critical and creative thinking, multicultural and global awareness, complex reasoning, and uh, written and also oral communication skills. We are really dedicated to collaboration, to creativity, uh, to equity, diversity and inclusion, and to student success. And we're really proud that we have internationally known researchers and scholars um, who work really closely with our students, both our undergraduate students and our graduate students in the classroom and also outside of the classroom to provide an education that bridges these areas of humanities, social sciences, and the natural and physical sciences as well. Next slide, please. So why study arts and sciences at Western Michigan University? Well, we are the largest of the academic colleges um, here at Western. We have more than 4,500 students, uh, about 1,000 of those are graduate students. Um, the rest are undergraduate students. Our classes actually tend to be quite small. Our student to faculty ratio is 11 to 1. And we, off we offer an enormous breadth of um, majors and minors as well as graduate programs. So at the undergraduate level, more than 100 different majors and minors, and I'll show you some specifics about that. Um, in just a couple minutes. At the graduate level, we have more than 50 master's, um, PhD, or graduate certificate programs. We have a lot of researchers, as I mentioned, and we have well over 150,000 uh, square feet of laboratory and research space. Um, many of our undergraduate as well as graduate students work in that research space um, side by side with our, our scholars, um, our faculty scholars in the college. We have many registered student organizations, more than 40, um, which are associated with specific departments, um, things like the, the clubs, the geology club, the biology club, um, pre-medical society, lots of other clubs like that, um, that are, are really closely um, connected to our departments and to our faculty. And as I've mentioned, we really do have a world-renowned faculty here at Western. Our faculty routinely receive grants from places like the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, the Department of Education, um, the Guggenheim Foundation, uh, the Fulbright Association, and, and many more. Uh, we're also home at Western Michigan University, not just in arts and sciences, but the university as a, as a whole, uh, to the Theta ch uh, Michigan chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. That's the, the country's oldest and most respected honor society for um, the liberal arts and sciences. And we do induct members from other colleges as well as arts and sciences. Um, and it is a really a great honor and very prestigious to be able to host that chapter and also to induct our students into it. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we emphasize, much like um, Dean Butt and Dean Deshpande talked about in their colleges, is experiential learning opportunities. We really think it's important for our students to have a chance to engage in hands-on learning, um, again, side by side with our faculty. And, and we do that in labs. We also do that in the community. Um, we have a very large and, and broad college, so I've just picked out a, a very few of the opportunities that we have. Um, but those include things like our capital intern program, where our students in political science have a chance to work in Lansing, typically, um, with our elected officials, with nonprofits, and really learn how our government is operating. We have a communication and social robotics lab, um, which is a, a very interesting place where you can interact with robots and understand um, how to use robots uh, to really uh, better communicate um, with, with people. Our Fort St. Joseph archaeological project is a, a long-standing project in the community of Niles um, on the west side of the state, where students can go and do hands-on archaeology um, right there at the site during the summer. Our Kalamazoo Autism Center is uh, really nationally and, and internationally known for the work that we do with autistic children, and we have many students who train to work in that facility. And then we're also home to the Michigan Geological Survey, and we have a lot of students who get engaged in work that's associated with that facility, as well as many others, um, as I, I mentioned already. Uh, we also try to, to fund a lot of these opportunities, so we do have um, scholarships available for students who are engaged in research and creative activities. Um, with our faculty. And so that's a, a nice opportunity to get some funding to help with specific projects. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you um, a really quick overview of the many programs that we have in the humanities, um, in the social sciences, and in the STEM areas in science and mathematics. So we'll go through those quickly because there are a lot of them, but I know that you have these slides that you can review later if you'd like more information about specific programs. So next slide is humanities, and uh, we are home to 25 different departments, schools, and interdisciplinary institutes in the College of Arts and Sciences. 
In the humanities at the undergraduate level, we offer majors in our School of Communication, in our departments of Comparative Religion, English, History. Um, medieval Studies is really unique here, and we're, we're very well known internationally for our Medieval Studies program. That's an interdisciplinary program. We also have a Department of Philosophy, we have Spanish, and then we have our World Languages and Literatures program, um, our department as well. Next slide. Um, in Science and Mathematics, our departments include Biological Sciences, Chemistry, our Interdisciplinary Environment and Sustainability Studies um, Institute, our Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences, Department of Geography, um, mathematics, physics, psychology, and also statistics. So we offer a very wide breadth of um, majors and minors within uh, physical sciences, natural sciences, and mathematics. And then within social uh, sciences, next slide, we have our departments of economics, gender and women's studies, our interdis interdisciplinary program in global and international studies, our interdisciplinary intercultural and anthropological studies uh, institute, and then our Department of Political Science, our School of Public Affairs and Administration, and our Department of Sociology. Um, and I, I didn't mention, I should have mentioned that the large M and the little M on these um, slides indicate where we have majors or minors. And there are little red dots next to a lot of those. Those are the, the programs in which we have accelerated graduate degree programs, those same programs that um, Dean Butt was talking about in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, where students can um, accelerate their progress into a master's degree program by using some of their undergraduate programs in that graduate um, program's required curriculum. And so that can get you through a master's program pretty quickly um, and save you a lot of time and money. And so we've got a lot of those programs already and we're actually building more all the time. Um, next slide, please. So our master's and doctoral programs are also um, quite broad and, and we offer them in many different areas. And I'll give you an overview of those as well. So in the humanities, um, we, we offer both master's and doctoral degrees in our School of Communication, uh, Department of Comparative Religion, English, Spanish, and Philosophy. And then I think we have STEM coming up next. Okay, and then in our STEM areas, we offer master's and doctoral degrees in uh, biological sciences, chemistry, geography, geological and environmental sciences, mathematics, physics, psychology and statistics. Um, some of those I should point out are also collaborative with other colleges. So for example, our very rapidly growing uh, data science program is a collaboration with the, Depart with the Department of Computer Science um, in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And then next slide. And then within the social sciences, we offer uh, master's and doctoral degrees in programs including um, anthropology, economics, history, political science, public affairs and administration, and sociology, as well as interdisciplinary degrees in science education, as well as in um, medieval studies. So you can see we're a large and very broad and very diverse college with respect to the, the programs that we offer. Next slide. So I wanted to mention that one of the pillars um, of Western Michigan University is global engagement. And that's something we take very seriously um, in the College of, of Arts and Sciences. In addition to having many international students come to us, we really encourage our students to go out into the world to study. And that's really true at all of our um, academic colleges. So I know that's true in the Business College and the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences and our other colleges as well. Um, and you might be surprised to learn that a lot of our international students also study abroad. Um, we encourage everyone to study abroad and to take advantage of the opportunities that we offer um, in arts and sciences, we offer many faculty-led programs every year um, where our faculty are traveling closely with our students, um, teaching them about areas in, in which they have scholarly expertise. Um, and we do offer scholarships, as do many of the other colleges, um, as does the, the Henneke Institute, to help this um, experience be available to all of our students. So one out of 10 of our students do study abroad. Um, and again, lots of opportunities to get scholarships for that. Next slide. So this again just shows you um, a little glimpse of where some of our recent study abroad experiences um, were led. And these were the faculty led programs. We also have collaborations with institutes um, and uh, places around the world where our students study. But these are the ones where our faculty were, were leading programs. Next slide. Um, we do really emphasize, again, experiential learning and especially engagement in research and creative activities in the college. Um, we have many students who work side by side in laboratories 
um, with our with our scholars and and really have the opportunity um, to learn from them uh, side by side. Uh, as you've seen in the other colleges, our career outcomes I think are very strong. Within three months of graduation, more than ninety percent of our graduates are employed full time um, or part time or continuing their education, and that number also does go up. Um, if you go a little bit further out than three months. So really, I think excellent career outcomes. And another um, data point, which I think is really important is how much our faculty really care about our students and really get engaged with our students at Western Michigan University. When we surveyed our graduates, 98% of our graduates said they had at least one instructor who made them very excited about learning. And I think that's really important. And I think that is something that we really value here at Western. Next slide, please. Um, as you've seen from some of the other presentations, our students um, go to work at all kinds of really interesting places in Michigan and around the world. Um, they include very successful scientists, inventors, professors, lawyers, business leaders, nonprofit uh, world leaders, uh, again, all across the country and really across the globe. And we're very proud of what our graduates accomplish. I, and the last thing I wanted to, to um, include here, I'm not going to play these just in the interest of time, but I know you have access to this slide, uh, is on Facebook and also through these links, you can meet some of our award-winning faculty and learn a little bit more about the work that they're doing. And so I encourage you, if you're interested, um, to have a look at those links and learn a bit more about our faculty. So thank you for listening. And I think um, Lee Ryder is next up for the presentation. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to the forum. I'm going to be providing an over, overview of the immigration um, standpoint at the university right now, and then we'll save detailed questions for the end for Q&A. Next slide. Um, so first, I just want to assure you that some of these impacts and consular slowdowns and travel restrictions, they're, they're temporary due to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, but already, you know, we want to point out that there are exceptions that we're seeing for emergency appointments in some cases. Student visas will resume. Already we're seeing some cons consulates reopen. Um, there are exceptions and we see that the government is making frequent review of these policies. So the situation is, is fluid and we are seeing it begin to, to improve. Next slide, please. <laughs> So I want to point out that a lot of our programs, even though we hear things are on remote and, and there's COVID, we're still operating. And despite what you might hear in the news, immigration benefits are ongoing. Um, so the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, they're continuing to process immigration benefits, such as OPT for practical training, extensions, assisting students with change of status, and even H-1Bs are continuing to be approved inside the U.S. So our services are continuing and they're ongoing. We're assisting our students through virtual immigration advising uh, until we're returning to campus. And also we have staff available to assist our students with these requests. And there's also support for distance education and remote learning while students are abroad continuing their program. Next slide, please. Um, I also want to address that in the news, people have been questioning about what are these presidential proclamations that, that they're hearing about. And in a nutshell, the presidential proclamation that was announced in April, that was very, very limited. That was specifically for some immigrant visas um, issued from outside the United States. Um, it suspended it suspended those visas for a limited period of time. And I want to point out that it was for a very narrow group of immigrant visas with many exceptions. Um, it did not apply to those already holding an immigrant visa, and it did not apply to adjustment of status to green card within the U.S. or to U.S. lawful permanent residents. Um, this proclamation also did not apply to non-immigrant categories. Next slide. Um, following this proclamation was another one which extended the immigrant pro proclamation, and it also extended it to some work visas outside the U.S. 
I want to emphasize this did not impact student visas um, and this did not impact OPT. It also did not impact um, H-1B within the United States. So this, um, again, was very narrow. It's a narrow entry ban suspending certain work category visas, not student visas, not, not OPT, um, for people who are outside the United States at the time this was issued. So we are still processing OPT and H-1B change of status requests inside the United States. Also, all of our universities J-1 scholar program categories are, are still processed and ongoing as well. And this, this proclamation is extended through the end, end, of, end of the year. Next slide. So we want to um, address that there are ongoing travel restrictions for certain countries. Um, we're seeing this improve right now. Um, so any international student or uh, foreign national who's been in China, Iran, or Brazil for the past 14 days, there's still a restriction um, from entry to the U.S. at this point. It used to include um, Europe and um, UK and, and Ireland, but we saw that recently lifted for F1 students. It's still in place for J visa holders, but there is a process where they could request an extension until it is lifted for, for J visa travelers. Next slide, please. Um, a little note on international students. There's been a, a lot you've probably heard in, in the news um, about this in a recent lawsuit from Harvard, MIT um, against Homeland Security. Uh, what happened basically is in the, in the middle of a pandemic, Homeland Security agreed to allow schools and students to have temporary adaptations um, for students to study online or study from their home country and have their CVS active because of a pandemic. Um, but then Homeland Security came out with an announcement for fall guidance, wanting to say that if you're all online, um, they weren't going to allow that anymore. Harvard and MIT sued. Um, Department of Homeland Security decided to withdraw the fall guidance. So what's in place right now is the March guidance. And in a nutshell, um, but under the March guidance, students inside the U.S. who are studying whether hybrid or at all online schools, they can still continue their studies in the U.S. in that format until this is replaced by any, any new guidance. Um, and then also students outside the United States who went home to their home countries, the March guidance says they can continue to stay active if they're continuing in normal progress. Um, there's even um, some flexibility where if there's insufficient classes and schools notify their school, there's provisions to temporarily waive that. Um, so that flexibility is, is at this time continuing to be in place with March guidance and we're awaiting um, future guidance from Homeland Security um, in this area in the future. We have all the, the resources posted um, with direct links here if you would like to read that um, yourself firsthand. Next slide, please. Um, also a little bit about the J visa program. Um, we are waiting for the travel restrictions from certain countries um, to be released for certain J visa travelers. So for Europe, uh, Ireland, UK. Um, but otherwise, these proclamations that, that you've heard about, um, they do not apply to the J visa program. Um, so the Homeland Security guidance that specifically uh, addresses F1 students um, I just want to point out that there's there's different rules between the, the two visa categories, but generally the J visa program um, we find very flexible. We have um, ongoing programs for our students, and this is operational and, and fluid right now. Um, we're just waiting for some of the COVID-related um, restrictions to ease due to the pandemic. Next slide, please. 
thank you very much. We know there'll probably be a specific questions, um, which we can help address in the Q&A following. And next will be Dr. Mohanan. Good morning. Um, my name is M.K. Mohanan. I'm the Director of International Admissions and Services. Good morning, good, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, some of you are going to be uh, sleeping very soon, but thank you so much for staying late to listen to us. Uh, please, next slides, please. Well, we, uh, well, in Western Michigan University, we host about students from about 100 plus countries. And we have 265 degree programs, including bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs. We are one of the top 100 public research universities in the US. So next slide, please. Michigan is ranked, uh, ranked one of the top <coughs> most, I mean, Western Michigan is ranked in one of the top most affordable states uh, by Wallet and Hub. And Kalamazoo is ranked in one of the top 50 college towns in the US, according to the CNBC. Two and a half hours, I mean, we are located in between Detroit and Chicago, almost like equal distance between Detroit and Chicago. Chicago is a financial hub of you know, mid, the Midwestern states, and uh, Detroit is the headquarters of global automobile industries. So we are located in, be located in between these two major cities. Next slide, please. And our office consists of two major departments, the international admissions and also the immigration department. We, we have immigration trained, immigration advisors. We have trained admission counselors who are quite experts in the field, like international education, the educational systems in different countries. We are also experts in the immigration rules and regulations. And we have, in addition to that, we have Lee Ryder, who is also an immigration law, uh, you know, attorney, who is serving as our you know, immigration compliance director. So we are well equipped to advise students on the latest immigration rules and regulations. Next slide, please. And we have these colleges, colleges of, uh, colleges of arts and sciences, aviation, education and human development, engineering and applied sciences, fine arts, Hayworth College of Business and Health and Human Services. In addition to that, we also have two other colleges. The admissions of them are handled entirely in those colleges, College of Law and College of Medicine. So that is where they are not listed here, but we have, in addition to these listed colleges, we have two other colleges too. Next slide, please. And English proficiency requirement as stated here is that, uh, you know, the TOEFL, um, IELTS, TS, and last year we made some changes to include almost about four new types of uh, English proficiency tests. Basically, because of the COVID-19 situation, we were forced to, you know, adopt, um, you know, or, and adapt to uh, the international situation as it was emerging. As a result, we started accepting Met, Met is the, the old form of MILA, which was conducted by the University of Michigan, Duolingo, which is a, a new test, online test. And CEFR stands for the, um, the, the, the European Common Framework of Languages that is accepted in entire uh, European countries. So four types of new tests we started accepting in lieu of our uh, TOEFL requirements. And, uh, Basically, this is to expand the pool of our uh, you know, students from all over the place. So that is one of the new things we have implemented in the international admissions and services. Next slide, please. And we have Higgy scholarship. I would also like to mention that uh, in addition to the fact that we have three levels of um, scholarship ranges between 15,000 and 5,000. As you see, the GPS, the, the students who have high school GPS between 3.95 and 4 will be getting about $15,000 scholarship. And the middle level scholarship is between 3.7 and 3.9 for GPA, $7,500. And the lowest uh, the value scholarship is $5,000 between 3.5 and 3.69 GPA. 
And we last year we also expanded the scholarship to one semester for uh, pathway students you know, who are doing English language studies. Their academic courses will be those students who are enrolled in the pathway if they were um, also taking academic courses and if they were eligible to get the scholarship, that scholarship also covered during the pathway study. So practically they were getting nine semesters of scholarship. And one more thing I would like to mention is that students who are taking uh, scholarship recipients who are taking online classes also are eligible to get their tuition fee paid through the scholarship. Next slide, please. Okay, ne the next is uh, uh, Dr. Eva Kopija, who is the chairperson of the English Language Culture and Culture for International Students. Thank you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm Eva Kopia, I'm the Chair of Celsius, and today I would like to give you some highlights and basic information about our intensive English program here at Western Michigan University. Uh, uh, Celsius stands for Center for English Language and Culture for International Students. It is a long name. And uh, um, it is an intensive English program here at Western Michigan University. We have been in existence since 1975, so we are a well-established program, and our full um, uh, our faculty have a lot of experience working with international students, and they enjoy teaching English a lot. So we can help you with improving your English language proficiency. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our Celsius program offerings include basically two versions of the program. Our core program, Intensive English uh, program, uh, offers ESL classes, and we focus on preparing students to study at Western Michigan University, at academic programs, and also at other American colleges and universities. In addition, our Celsius classes can help professionals improve their English for their work and career purposes as well. Um, in addition to our core program, we also have Pathway program. And Pathway program is an excellent choice for the students who may not yet fully meet uh, language proficiency requirements uh, to enter undergraduate or graduate programs. But uh, through the Pathway program, they will be able to be enrolled, duly enrolled, and take some English courses, English as a second language, and at the same time, academic courses. So we do have some elig eligibility requirements to enter a Pathway program, but these requirements are not as high as full admission requirements. In addition, uh, there's a lot of flexibility that we offer here because students can actually start with just a Celsius program ESL classes only and upon completion of our pre-advanced level they can off, uh, they can enter pathway one level and at pathway one they can take some academic courses also upon completion of our advanced level they would be eligible to uh, enter pathway two level so there's a lot of flexibility there and they can combine studying um, ESL and taking academic courses. Uh, ESL courses offer students exceptional support, so if the students are experiencing problems with their academic coursework, uh, Celsius faculty will always be there to support the students and help them uh, in terms of their English language proficiency. So, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of English courses and Celsius courses, um, we have skill-based courses that are actually divided into speaking, listening, uh, grammar communication, and reading, writing coursework. Um, pathway 2 courses are a little bit more specialized. There are oral communication and written communication courses at a higher level. So uh, in terms of uh, students' levels of proficiency, we can accommodate uh, um, different levels of proficiency starting from elementary through advanced and advanced class uh, depending on the demand. Um, so basically we do have a lot of flexibility. A class is usually small, 
students would get a lot of individual attention and also opportunity to consult and meet with the teachers. So um, whether person to person or through WebEx in online format. So I think uh, Celsius um, offers a lot of opportunities. So those students who really need to would like to improve their English proficiency will always be welcome with us. And uh, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this presentation. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Sarah, who is actually one of our previous uh, Celsius students and current student uh, at Western Michigan University from Oman. Oh, Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Al-Kamshui from Southern City of Oman. I'm a junior student with a geochemistry major at Western Michigan University. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful for having this chance to speak today and share my experience with others. So let's start with how I became a Bronco or how I decided to be a Bronco. Actually, when I got this scholarship for studying geochemistry abroad, I had six uh, choices for six uh, universities all around the U.S. Uh, and I had some uh, like aspects or standards that I kept on mind uh, during choosing the university that I'm going to study my major on. And uh, one of these aspects or standards was the community that I'm going to live in. And for Kalamazoo, uh, I read and I heard a lot about how how oh, it is a quiet place, the people are very friendly, helpful, and educated. And to be honest, uh, I did see all what I read and heard about from the first day that I uh, arrived in Kalamazoo. And especially my experience with Celsius, uh, with this program, I uh, like, uh, I love how, uh, I love how the Celsius is uh, making us like, they help students to, to meet with the new people from all around the world, from different cultures, from different places. Uh, and also attending the Celsius events help us to uh, getting used to the campus facilities. Uh, actually, the role of Celsius office members didn't stop when I finished the program, but they always there for helping us if we have any issue or if we have any questions uh, until now even if they don't have the answer to our questions they will direct us to the right person who can help and who can answer our questions another aspect that i uh, looked at was the academic uh, or the best academic university for studying geology and for wmu we have individual department for geology which is geological and environmental science that's me i'm going to join a family with experts, educators, and specialized uh, academic advisors who work hard to help us uh, and mentor us with any issue that we are facing. Like, it's not just about the issues or, or problems that we are facing in our academic life. Like, they will help, help us with any issue that we are facing in our, uh, in our uh, academic life or in, like, they will help us to get over any any problem that we are facing. Uh, another thing is uh, studying geology at WMU means uh, receiving an education through classroom instructions, lab experiments, and field trips. They so they give us the opportunity to infer the information before they give it to us. Actually. Uh, Jumping to the next point, which uh, the university's role to keep students optimistic during this pandemic, uh, I feel like the essence of the WMU community and staff members has broken during this pandemic. They show us how it's, uh, the students' uh, psychological stability is more important to them uh, more than anything else. From the beginning of this pandemic until today, we are receiving support from academic, uh, our academic advisors, our professors, uh, from our uh, department community, the International Admission and Services Office, uh, as well as the Services uh, Office members and the Honors College community. 
Um, at the end, uh, I just want to tell the other student to uh, stay optimistic and never give up and don't ever forget that we are Broncos, we are strong, and nothing can stop us, even the viruses. So I'll be here. If you have any question, uh, feel free to, to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and we, we ended our panel with the, with the most important voice for all of you, which is the voice of our students. And it's also always so rewarding to hear our students talk about um, how they feel at home and enjoy our community and, and uh, the academic experiences they, they have here. Now, we've been receiving many questions through um, YouTube. I have to say that it's, I've had an opportunity to go over our um, YouTube chat and it's amazing to see how our students um, are so kind to us and, and, and you know, and, and we have good morning and good afternoon and good night messages from all over the world, you know, from Congo and Indonesia and Brazil and, you know, it's, it's really amazing. Um, I have a few uh, main topics around um, um, around which we have several questions, um, and one of them um, that I can actually clarify very quickly is um, about scholarships and online. Some students have questions about uh, if their scholarships, um, what happens to their scholarship if they're taking online uh, classes. Uh, and I will obviously let Dr. Mohanan, um, our Director of International Missions and Services, also reply. But I, you know, very briefly, I can say that your scholarships apply towards tuition. Uh, and it can be tuition in, in generated by any kind of uh, um, course we have. We're, we're going to be on a hybrid model semester, as you know. We will have some classes in person, some classes will be hybrid, which are classes composed of some online and some in person. Um, and we have uh, classes that are fully online, so fully, on, fully in person, fully online or hybrid. And your, your scholarship applies to tuition, be it generated by one kind of course or another kind of course. But uh, Dr. Mohanan, would you like to Add yeah. anything to this question about scholarships? Yeah, the, the scholarship, um, the availability of the scholarship has no bearing on the type of, on the, on the mode of instruction that you take. For example, if you are taking online course, hybrid course, or in-person courses, you will get the scholarship so long as you meet the other requirements. So the mode of, mode of delivery of the classes has no bearing on the scholarship. Um, another question, or several questions around this topic, um, and this one probably go to our deans, um, are questions about um, labs, uh, research theses, and online. How do you, um, how do you manage, uh, and what are the opportunities for students who need to do uh, lab work or research work and uh, would need to be um, fully online, what are the possible accommodations um, that you have? And I could um, start by uh, Dr. Karla Koretsky, since obviously arts and sciences is many of these courses as well. <laughs> sure, I'm happy, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think what we've been doing is really just trying to maintain maximum flexibility and accommodation for students because the, the individual you know, circumstances vary so much. But um, as soon as it was safe to return to research labs, according to the, the state of Michigan governor, um, we began a process so that faculty could come back to their labs carefully with safety um, procedures in place um, initially, we only allowed graduate students to return into labs, but now we're also accommodating undergraduate research in labs, just trying to, to ramp up slowly again to make sure that everyone is safe in the work that they're doing. Um, some of our students are engaged in scholarship that can be done virtually or remotely, and so those students are continuing to work virtually remotely in many cases. 
Um, but we really try to tailor that on an individual basis so that each student can figure out what's working for them. And if um, Dr. Despandi or um, Dr. Buck would like to add to this? Yeah, I can, you know, we, we don't do the kind of labs that they do in sciences, but, you know, we have our, uh, uh, like our financial uh, Greenlit Trust room. Uh, everything has gone virtual, so you can access all the uh, Bloomberg software and all that that were just limited to the labs are now accessible online. So we work with all the companies that all the data and other things you need to do your projects or research and everything is accessible online. Uh, our sales training, which is one-on-one, -on -one, uh, is also going virtual. So instead of uh, sitting across a table from a professor and trying to sell something, uh, you could be selling this on Teams or WebEx or uh, any of these online software. So we have gone virtual wherever possible. And like Dr. Kresge said, uh, you know, it's uh, when things improve in the state of Michigan and we're allowed to uh, have... Uh, Close interactions, then we will go back into these closed areas where actually you would interact in an office. Otherwise, everything will be on a virtual basis. Thank you. Um, perhaps I'd like um, Dr. Bhatt to also address this, but including um, some comments about the research thesis. Yes, yeah, so if I can just say about the labs first, especially the teaching labs, it's, it's, in, in some cases it's, it's uh, faculty slash department dependent. I mean, there are some, some uh, really uh, unique things that have come out of this last year uh, where some of the labs that traditionally would have to be in, in, uh, in a lab space have been able to come up with some, some interesting ideas where maybe a lab assistant is doing the laboratory assignment within the space and you're actually interacting with that student in real time. So there are some really, really cool things that have actually started to come out of that. So, um, so I think, again, if, if you're interested and have a specific class in line, I would definitely reach out to the faculty member or the department chair. Um, so that's with respect to teaching. Now the other question, Paula, I just forgot what you asked me. That uh, The thesis courses, if students yes. need to continue. So yeah. those, I know there are some accommodations as well for those. Yeah, and we, we've done well uh, uh, in, in continuing all the thesis and, uh, and dissertation uh, activities. There has been, um, you know, there was some slowdown in the spring semester when we first closed down, but we've now been able to uh, make accommodations for research spaces, as Dr. Kresge was talking about. We now have students back in. A lot of the research labs that have plans that uh, keep our, our students and staff very safe. Um, in addition, you know, just to, if, if you're looking at the defenses of both the thesis and the dissertations, those have been taking place online. So there's not been any slowdown in terms of students uh, graduating on time, uh, assuming that the work is, is complete. So I, at the moment, I think that's the same in all colleges, that uh, the ability to now do things online uh, is becoming better and better, and uh, in, in some cases, it's even better than what we had before in, in the in person. So. Thank you. Uh, we also have a um, few questions about um, uh, online tuition um, versus in-person tuition, and all our tuition rates are published on our website. Um, but, um, courses that are fully online or credits for fully online courses um, usually have or typically have a lower um, a lower tuition rate. Uh, so if you're doing exclusively online, you might have a lower um, tuition rate. Uh, Western Michigan also announced that we'll not be changing our tuition for this um, uh, academic year, so the tuition rate will be the same as uh, last year. Um, there's another, there are, there are some questions about um, uh, visas, especially uh, connected with embassy opening dates. Now, of course, we cannot give you the dates <laughs> for the opening dates for your local embassies because we don't know them, and unfortunately, uh, the U.S. State Department, and in many cases, some of your consulates throughout the world are not announcing 
on their websites their reopening dates. Um, but we do have some accommodations in terms of uh, uh, time for entry in the United States and uh, uh, and and how late you can get your visas. But I'd like uh, to ask Lee Ryder if um, she could comment on on visas and um, obtaining um, the visa and um, and dates for um, arriving in the U.S. for fall semester. All right, so, so check with your consulate. We know that even as they're reopening, students are reporting that they're getting a, a late visa date, potentially. If that happens to you, um, reach out to International Missions and Services to see what might be the best plan for you. If you should defer your, your entry date, your start date for CBIS purposes to spring, and if there are courses to enroll from, for, from abroad, or what we're working on doing is if you have certain courses that are hybrid, we can assist students with a late arrival I-20. Um, so if students are arriving after September 2nd and if their program can accommodate its potential to, to get a, a late arrival I-20, um, even for October, um, potentially through the end of October, to arrive for a program that might be able to accommodate this. Um, so stay in communications with, with your counselors for what might be a program that, that could be suitable to you. So in some cases, students could arrive late. In other cases, uh, deferral might, might be a better option. Um, in any case, what we do know from the consulates is for students who are new or initial or coming, they, they do want to see that there's some grounded courses in the U.S. in order to be able to, to enter. Um, that was Homeland Security's original guidance. We know they like grounded courses. Fortunately, we are a hybrid school, so we do have a mix of course offerings. Um, and International Admissions and Services stands ready to assist with putting a notation on the I-20 as needed to say that this is, this is hybrid to help assist our students with their visa appointment and seeing that, oh, there are some hybrid course offerings that I need to get to the U.S. for. I hope that helps. Um, also, I saw there is a there was a question in chat that uh, a concern that I heard immigration officers have the power to send you back if you do not show them your if you do not show them your visa. How worried should I be about that? Um, well, the way U.S. visa law has always worked is someone needs a visa, a valid visa, in order to come to a port of entry um, to ask to be admitted for entry for that purpose and for that period of time. Um, so when one has the visa, it's basically that threshold evidence that one meets all the um, baseline requirements to enter the country, but it always is the discretion of the officer if they see that something doesn't match or they don't they think that someone has a different intent um there is that power most countries have that that power to say you know we're not going to admit this person it's very very rare um and this is where it's going to be really important to students we want you to be able to print out your I-20 when you come to the border, have your valid visa. Because there is COVID and pandemic, um, check the resources that, that we have or contact our office. We have the links to the Fragman Law Firm, updated summaries country by country on what the, the country conditions are for entry. If, if your country is still subject to um, a restriction saying if you're entering from this country in 14 days, so still China, Iran, Brazil, don't try to re-enter um, because there's that COVID restriction in place. Um, if a student thinks that you know they are personally ill or potentially impacted by, by COVID, don't try to travel um, if you're sick at that time. Like reach out, reach out to the international office to say, you know, what are my alternatives? What are my plans? So potentially it could be deferral or, or delayed I-20. A lot of this can vary on case-by-case -case basis too. 
Thank you. Uh, also, some questions about um, online um, regarding credits and credit hours. Our online classes work with the same system of credits that our hybrid or in-person classes. And uh, but again, I'd um, defer to Dr. Mohanan uh, for any comments on that. Well, um, if you are abroad and if you are taking online classes and if you are a continuing student, you must maintain the full-time course level in order to maintain your status so that we can keep your serious record active here um, in the US. And if you are a newly admitted, like a fall newly admitted student, and if you have difficult, I mean, if you are, you can register without an I-20 or without a visa, you can register for classes from, from abroad. Well, this is specifically applicable to the fall 2020 newly admitted students. You can register for classes without having a student visa or without having an I-20 as such. But you don't need to be complying with any visa rules or regulations because you are not under the US, US visa status as of, as of now. But those who are taking online classes for the fall semester and those who are planning to come for the spring 2021 semester, you should have a new ITND for the spring 2020 semester for personal attendance. So um, those who are newly admitted, you don't need to be um, fully enrolled. There is no restriction as to how many credit hours you can take. You can take undergraduate students, the minimum credit hour for full-time status is 12. For graduate students, it is six. You don't need to be, um, you know, complying with that regulation. You, you can take just one course of like engineering courses of three credit, or you can take 10 credit hours as an undergraduate student, it will not have any kind of impact. But we do advise students to, if you have been admitted for the fall semester, we do advise that you can register for classes. Now, um, continuing the previous question, there are so many different varieties of, you know, enrollment. You can register in person semester in person class register for in person classes for that you must be here but you can register for hybrid classes that means you will be registering for the classes as a you know through distance education mode from your home country and then after when you get the visa maybe by the middle of october or late october you need to contact us so that we can send an update right and the uh, lee rider has advised us that it is possible for us to do that in that case, you need to have a new ITND, but please make sure when you come maybe sometime by the middle of October, make sure you have an updated ITND printed with you. Second thing is, the most important thing is that you have to show some kind of proof of enrollment. If you are coming late, you should show that you are already a continuing student. As an online student, now the rest of the class is going to be in person as on a hybrid mode. So those are the requirements you know, in terms of your full-time enrollment and in terms of your registration status. If you have any additional, I don't know if I answered the questions fully, but if you have any more questions, please, please ask me. Thank you. Uh, there's a question also about um, how to choose online courses or hybrid courses or um, um, in person how do you know um, what kind of a, what kind of a, a course um, you are you have to, to do or, or is there available for you I don't know if um, our deans would like to help perhaps Dr. Koretsky if you um, wouldn't mind helping with this. Sure, I'd be happy to, to jump in. Um, so we, as we've been planning for fall, we have made some changes in how we're listing our courses and how we're offering our courses. So um, what you will find is that courses are offered in one of five different formats. So two of those are purely online. Um, those are referred to as online asynchronous and online synchronous. So an online asynchronous course means that it's fully online and there's no um, specific course time when students all need to be online together. So you can do the work on your own time um, that, that you decide when it's convenient for you to do the work. If it's a synchronous online course, it means that there are at least some components of the purely online course where you do need to be attending class at a specific 
day of the week, time of the day. And so that's something to be paying attention to when you're looking at those purely online courses. For um, the other categories, we have a, what we call face-to-face -face or in-person. So that would be a fully um, main campus in-person experience where you're coming to class for each of the class meetings. Um, then we also have hybrid options. And so for the hybrid options, some of the work is online and then some of the work is face-to-face -face in person. And that online work then could be either the asynchronous that I talked about before, or it could be the synchronous. So there's a lot to kind of take in and think about. Um, it's a little different than usual in signing up for courses this year. You can find out what of uh, those different formats a course is being offered in if you go to our course offerings page. So that's on the registrar's page. And if you um, look at that um, list of classes, it will tell you if that class is online or if it's face-to-face -face or if it's hybrid, and it will give you um, meeting times if it is a, a course that includes in-person um, times. There's a lot to take in here, so I would really strongly encourage you to work closely with academic advisors to understand exactly what your course um, schedule might look like and, and how um, some of those, those pieces that are happening synchronously, whether they're online or in person, uh, are going to kind of interact with each other. So I would definitely encourage you to work closely with your academic advisors on that, but hopefully that gives you kind of a, an overview um, of how we're doing things. And, and maybe one of the other deans would like to jump in if I missed anything there. I, I would like to add one thing to that. In fact, the College of Engineering has given us a list of courses that are categorized as in-person classes, hybrid classes, online classes. So we will be sending out that course list to our poten uh, potential students. And students who are already admitted at the graduate level. Um, so an invitation will be sent out to uh, newly admitted graduate engineering students. So sometime this week or early next week, we will also hold a virtual meetings with the College of Engineering admitted graduate students. We have already completed the process. Only thing is to um, to send out the invitation and we also have the list of courses. All the, the list has specifically said this is in-person classes or, or hybrid course or online, fully online course. So based on that, students can choose the the course they want to enroll either from abroad or when they are already here. And the registrar's website also gives uh, the details about the type of courses that we are offering for the fall semester. So stu students can very well see what type of courses they are enrolling. I would also like to jump in. Thank you very much. Um, although students should try to get a full course of study and make full-time progress under the current March guidance that is, is in place at this time, it, it does indicate that if you are a student and for some reason there's not sufficient course offerings for you to get full-time course load and you, you work with your academic advisor and you notify the international office, it's possible under current guidance that, that the full course of study requirement could be waived due to COVID. Um, but this is only if there's not enough offerings and you, you work with your academic advisor and the international office um, to document this carefully. Um, it's important that students try to get their full course of study. Um, that, that is the, the normal standard and Western has numerous course offerings to try to make that happen. But if you're finding, if you fall into that exception, please notify IAS and your academic advisor so we can assist you through that. Uh, I would like to jump in as well and answer, address the question pertaining to ESL. I saw that there was some interest and a question regarding online courses for ESL. And I'm pleased to announce that we'll be offering online um, options for the students who are in their own countries. It's going to be a full program or the students can choose which courses they would like to take. Since if uh, the students remain in their own country, they're not required to get an I-20. So um, for our new students who offer uh, online placement, 
So there is an option actually to complete Celsius program online and upon completion of the program, those students who would uh, successfully pass their courses will be eligible to enter undergraduate program. So uh, we will have the contact information so for, for the students who are interested in studying English online this fall, um, please uh, you can contact me directly or um, our assistant director as well. Uh, so we will be working with you individually and we can uh, arrange the placement test for you. And um, as far as our classes, online classes are concerned, they're mostly asynchronous to accommodate different time zones because we realize that uh, it, it's, but we do offer also synchronous WebEx sessions that will be recorded for those of you who are not able to attend this session at a real time, you will also have an opportunity to view those sessions. So, uh, um, for those of you who are interested in studying online, please contact me directly and I'll be happy to give you further explanation about those courses. But uh, they will be basically the same type of courses that you will be taking in person here um, and upon completion and passing those courses, um, with our highest level, you will be eligible to enter our undergraduate program. So, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, there is also a, another um, question regarding scholarships, and it is um, what kind of um, support can you get for um, other costs behind, uh, besides tuition? So, even if you get a full uh, a, a, a scholarship that covers almost your full tuition, what other opportunities are there to cover um, living costs and you know all, all the other costs beyond tuition? Uh, we have three levels of scholarship. The, the highest one is 15,000, the second is 7,500, the other is 5,000. So assuming that a student has $15,000 scholarship, the scholarship is disbursed in two installments, basically for the fall semester and the spring semester when they enroll on a full-time basis. The money is paid toward the payment of their tuition and the related fee, but we do not pay to any other source. The, the money is also not disbursed directly to students. So basically that is the cost of attendance, uh, but not cost of living. So if our deans could refer to um, maybe some of the um, potential uh, funding opportunities uh, for students beyond tuition uh, in the form of perhaps or uh, graduate assistantships and so forth. Because we also have, um, we have many undergraduate students, but we also have our partner universities and country liaisons who also um, have um, graduate students. I can say a couple of things about our college. Um, first, at the undergrad level, <coughs> excuse me, at the undergrad level, we do have um, differential tuition scholarships that are, are, are available and eligible, uh, students, all students are eligible for. Uh, those Unfortunately, would not be for the first year coming in. Those are after you have already been at Western for, for a year. But there is the potential to um, actually apply for those scholarships. And all departments right now within the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences have, have that ability. Uh, at the graduate level, there are very few scholarships, per se, but there are assistantships as Paula was uh, discussing. Um, so uh, the students can work. Uh, and so tuition would be included in that as well as the stipend that the students can use for living. Those are, um, at the department level, they are uh, very competitive. Um, so there aren't, you know, a huge number of those. And typically, the way those work is um, very few are given to new students coming in. They're typically given to students who have been with us for, for a year. But there is, there is the opportunity for both. Uh, Participants you made some sort of connection with a faculty member or the department prior uh, to actually arriving. So that's what we have available right now. So at the Hayward College of Business, we are pretty similar to what you see in engineering. We're pretty much uh, the same. The only difference is uh, we do give scholarships to incoming freshmen too. So you don't have to wait for a year 
And uh, uh, so those cognitive scholarships are purely based on merit. And then um, for the College of Arts and Sciences, the majority of our undergraduate scholarships are specific for things like research and creative activities work, although there are some departments that also offer scholarships beyond that. Um, at the graduate level, we offer a, a very large number of graduate assistantships, both teaching assistantships and also research assistantships. Uh, and much like uh, Dean Butt mentioned, those are very department specific. They are competitive, um, but we do have many students, uh, first year students included, who come in on graduate assistantships in uh, many of the departments in the College of Arts and Sciences. So there you really need to have a conversation with the, the graduate advisor in that department, with the faculty of that department to understand what, what are their admission criteria um, and what the criteria to receive a graduate assist assistantship. I would also like to add one more thing about the scholarship. Nobody needs to apply separately for the scholarship, any scholarship at the undergraduate level. When you are applying for admission, your academic credentials will be evaluated to determine whether or not you are eligible to get the scholarship. And those who, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you a GPA, high school GPA is between 3.9, 5 and 4, you will be eligible to get the $15,000 scholarship. So you do not need to apply di uh, separately for the scholarship. You are automatically considered, provided the, we, the, we do not run out of money because uh, we receive quite a num large number of applications quite early. So we have limited amount of money in the scholarship, but those who meet the requirements will be automatically considered. You don't need to separately apply. And the tuition, uh, we cover mostly the tuition fee. And uh, like a cost of living allowance is not something that we pay. That is at the graduate level for if you have a GTA or DRA or GA ship or something, that may be covered in, in terms of uh, a stipend or something, which is part of the grad GTA, GRA, uh, GA. Uh, but undergraduate students and free scholarship do not get a cost of living allowance or something similar to that. Um, going back to the ESL courses that we talked about earlier, just to um, cover one more question here, I just want to ensure our ESL students that all the ESL courses can be taken online. So every, um, every level of ESL and all the courses within each level, uh, all, the, all the levels that we offer now, they can all be taken online. Graduate students or undergraduate students, there was a question here about that. I just wanted to clarify that. All ESL courses can be taken online. Uh, there were a f couple of very specific questions, but I, I, I think it's um, uh, worth covering. One is definitely something that um, um, other students might be experiencing. Um, a student mentioned that. Um, um, She's having problems translating some of her documents because the translator is closed. The translator's office is closed. The services are not um, available due to COVID-19. Um, and so perhaps uh, Dr. Manon would like to um, suggest um, other things and obviously getting in touch with our office. Every time you have this kind of problem, Get in touch with uh, with the Hanuk Institute with our international admissions uh, unit um, because our admissions counselors are there to help you. But Dr. Manan, I don't know if you want to. Sure. Uh, yeah, I would like to. Let me see if I. Okay, I would like to say that uh, um, you know if if you have a, a transcript in a different language and if you are unable to get the English translation, still we would suggest that you still upload those transcripts online as you are, when you apply. And uh, there are some of our counselors who may know a little bit more about foreign languages or else since in some of the previous institutions where I worked, you know, we sent to one of our uh, language departments, faculty members to, to help us you know, translate these documents. So our goal is basically to turn your applications into enrollment. So 
whatever way we can do to help you translate your transcript by ourselves, if it is possible, we'll try to do that. But if there is some difficulty, we will let you know and we'll give you different options. But just because you cannot trans translate a transcript doesn't mean that you should not apply. And upload your documents and then we will try to work with you in order to get this done uh, in terms of translating those documents. Another interesting question was about um, uh, wondering about if you have any partnership with the banks um, for loans, and this was banking in the particular in this particular case was if we have any partnership with banks in India for loans, and we don't have partnerships with financial institutions, but we can submit um, information that can help you secure those loans, of course, information regarding, you know, your admission to Western Michigan, right, yeah. uh, the courses you're registered for, um, your good academic standing at Western Michigan, I mean, those are information that if you need them for any purpose, uh, we are here to uh, submit that information to you so that, or directly to the um, institutions you're working with um, because obviously this is information that is always available to you for your cases. Yeah, I would like to add that um, some of the banks, if you apply for a student loan, some of the banks would like to see a confirmation of admission or an offer of admission. So based on if you are, if you are looking for an offer of admission in order to get the loan sanctioned, we are ready to help you with that. We are, we are willing to send you an admission letter saying that you have been offered admission. But at this time, we will not be able to send the visa documents unless and until you receive the bank documents or your financial guarantee. So most banks will accept that as a confirmation of admission. A couple of um, follow-up um questions and answers and topics we've covered before, but one again about ESL, because I mentioned online, ESL courses being available online, I want to reassure our students that they're also available in person, so we have both options. Um, and also about um, hybrid courses, many of the hybrid courses may have the option to be taken online. And obviously, this is, this depends on the course and the course's instructor. Um, but uh, thinking of the case of uh, several graduate courses uh, in our College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, um, I guess is that this might also be true for arts and sciences and business and perhaps other colleges. But I don't know if your our deans want to add um, anything to the flexibility that we're, we have been constantly working on in terms of trying to expand these uh, delivery modes so we can accommodate as many student cases as possible. Yeah, you know, what I'd add is we have many classes which have multiple sections which could be taught under different, uh, which could be taught different ways. So you may have a class where one section is face-to-face, uh, -face, one is hybrid, and a couple of online. So. For many classes, especially at the undergrad level, and then in the MBA core, we have multiple sections which may be offered through different media. There was also there are also some questions about the total tuition levels. Those I really like you to consult our website, but also work with our international missions counselors because. Uh, your tuition may vary in terms of college and the program that you're attending. And so if I give you one number here, that might not work for uh, every single case. So uh, I'd like to, I'd like you to work with them, um, with your um, uh, colleges, but also what's published on our website in terms of tuition for the academic year 2021. And again, uh, international missions and services, uh, missions counselors, always there to help you. Um, we have a great team, very devoted to our international students. Now we're um, at the time for wrapping up our session here. 
Um, and I'd like to just as a final comment, um, direct my, my final words today for international students. I was, I was an international student too uh, in the US. Um, um, I don't want to say many years ago, but yeah, it was many years ago. <laughs> uh, sometimes it feels like it was just a few years ago uh, when I see and talk to our international students um, because you, you revive all the emotions and, and, and um, experiences of being an international student in the US in me when I talk to you. Um, it was even back then when I, when I had, was an international student and I was an international student on several occasions. It was exciting, but it was also challenging. Um, it was, it is even more challenging now given the uncertainty we are all dealing with. Not international students, human beings in general, all over the world, we are dealing with unprecedented levels of uncertainty. And I'd like to remind you that you, are, you have been all admitted to, this, we have many admitted, a newly admit, continuing and newly admitted international students here. You've been admitted to Western Michigan University. Um, remember that when you're less certain of uh, yourselves, when your self-confidence is low. You have been admitted to a great university you are already experienced, have already experienced, if you're a continuing student, or will be experiencing soon, what it is to be a part of um, this community, of Western Michigan University. We're talking about a community of over 250,000 people all over the world, our alumni, over 100, in over 140 countries. Um, we have Broncos everywhere in the world, and we have international students currently everywhere in the world, as you know, because right now you're watching us from <laughs> so many countries. Um, I'd like to remind you that um, you have been very successful. You have great self-confidence. Otherwise, you had not come this way. You had not come all the way to being admitted at a top university in the United States. Um, the fact that you had the courage uh, to want to study abroad says something about you. So don't forget that. You have the self-confidence that is necessary to go through uncertainty. And we know you do, and we know you'll, be, you'll continue to be successful. And we're here to help you be successful, because that's what we do. That's what we're here for. So thank you so much to our panelists today. Uh, to join us, uh, to having joined us for, for this session. We will be scheduling more information sessions, some of them more specific for just for our newly admitted students, others for um, scholarship, scholarship issues and so forth. You receive information about this. Um, very special thank you to our three deans here today, Dr. Koretsky, Dr. Deshpande, and Dr. Bhatt, thank you so much for joining us. We know that you, you know, this is a very busy time, and uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken from your day to, to join, join us here and be with our international students and our global network. So, uh, again, if you have more questions, I'm sure you uh, reach out to the Hanneke Institute and um, go Broncos. And we're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you.